The great myth that was created by the war was a myth that government was efficient. And it was, we won for war. wartime purposes, mm -hmm. in, at least in, in Britain and the United States. It wasn't so efficient in Germany and the losing countries. But why was that a myth? It was a myth because it is one thing for government to plan and to control an economy for a single overriding objective, a si one solitary objective, win the war. It's a very different thing for government to control the economy for the many numerous tastes of all of us of a very large number of people in a complex world. And I, you ask the question of whether people's opinions can be changed. Yes. I can't change their opinions, you can't change their opinions, but experience is changing their opinions. Is there anybody anywhere now who believes that government is an efficient way to run an industrial enterprise? I think your question, can you get the genie back into the bottle, is a very important one. It is undoubtedly true that in democratic countries there will be a public urge expressed through the political process for something to be done about anything that seems to be wrong. The one thing that inhibits that is the belief that it can't be done. There is no politically expressed desire for the government to do something about the weather because it is widely believed that the government does not control the weather. It was widely believed under the gold standard and pre-Keynes that there was nothing the government could do about the kind of economic uh, trade cycle and depressions that we had before that time. Since then, it is very widely believed, Milton may believe, I may believe wrongly, but nonetheless, it's very widely believed that that is now a manageable thing, and therefore the demand is expressed that unemployment should not rise too high, inflation should not rise too high, and so forth. That we should if, have a war on want or a war yeah. on poverty. Now, if you believe, as Milton does, and on this issue I agree with him, that in fact government cannot handle this issue, and you want to get that genie back into the bottle, you can't simply do it by authorities or pundits or academics or others saying, here is a new rule, the government will do nothing. It will not intervene, it will not perform, there will just be a simple monetary rule. You've got politically to persuade people that this is part of a system which they can understand, which will in fact deliver for them the minimal economic objectives that they have, which are basically high employment, high employment and stability of prices and one or two other things. Now in order to do that, you've got to describe a political economic system which will in fact deliver that result. And they will not believe, and in my opinion they will rightly not believe, that simply going back to where we were or where we imagined that we were in 1930 or 1870 uh, by withdrawing the government from the game and doing nothing else will produce that result and they're right not to believe it. The uh, kind of pristine view that you appear to be putting up of no government isn't really a consistent view. Because I'm not putting up a view of no government. I'm putting up a view of a limited government, limited to Questions specific how functions. You, how you, how you impose that, the limit? Note that today the budget of HEW is one and a half times the whole defense budget. That is not where the major growth of government has come. Whether we spend too little or too much on, on the military is a very arguable issue which I'm not competent to discuss. Yeah, okay. But it is yeah, not okay. the cutting edge of the dispute that we're engaged in. That cutting edge is on all these other functions which government has uh, increasingly taken on its shoulders. How yeah, but the do question, you get from uh, here yeah. to there? By persuading people to do it and by doing it gradually. You do not get it overnight. CAB was a very, very persuasive element on, uh, on getting rid of one branch of regulation. The failure of government to produce the full employment and the stable prices that was promised is another. You know, what, whom are we kidding? Is there anybody around anymore who really believes the government knows how to prevent by its present methods, inflation or unemployment. We've had increasing inflation. We've had increasing unemployment, not only in the United well, we, States. We, now, we, we know, know this wait, government wait, does wait, not. Wait, wait, wait. It seems to me that we're talking about at least four kinds of government intervention of differing popularity among the public. One is redistributive via the social security system and so on, and lots of that is popular. Welfare is unpopular, but social security is quite popular. Uh, Medicare has a mixed reputation, Medicaid a bad reputation. The redistrib re redistributive system is a mixed bag from the public standpoint. Another kind of intervention deals with unemployment, a third kind deals with prices, and a fourth kind deals with regulation. Now, again, there is a cry about regulation which itself breaks down, it seems to me, into two parts, partly a safety kind of thing, partly an economic kind of thing. I doubt that the public is prepared, for example, to eliminate the Food and Drug Administration. Take the way of trying to smooth out the business cycle. All right, now wait on that. I think that the record of doing this in its clumsy way, Republicans, Democrats, assorted administrations in England and elsewhere, 
between 1945 and 1973 was quite good. Average unemployment during this considerable span of years was lower than it had been, uh, probably in any previous uh, spell of modern economic history. Inflation was not a persistent problem in this. Now, I would say, putting the claim at a very modest one, that Keynesian intervention, if we use that as a label, worked pretty well for a whole generation. Now, anything that works well for a whole generation isn't entirely bad. From the fact, from that fact, and the undeniable fact that things are working poorly now, are we to conclude that the Keynesian sort of mixed regulation was wrong, yes. or alternatively, that we need still more regulation? That's my conclusion, I might say. You want the right people manipulating the, the uh, uh, levers. But go back. Uh, memory smooths things out. If you really look at that 25-year period you're talking about, it was not a period of stability. It was a period that was punctuated by the very sharp inflation of the Korean War. It was a period that was punctuated by uh, three recessions in the course of about eight years in the 50s and early right. 60s. It was a period in which you had a uh, in inflation really starting to go from creeping to running in the latter 60s. It was a period which laid the groundwork for the kind of situation in which we are now, where you have both higher unemployment and higher inflation. It was the... That I mean, there were these movements, uh, as we say, but they weren't the movements like the 1930s. There was a recession in 58. Yes, we all called it a recession. We all worried about it and so on. But it was a small thing, little potatoes. The same thing was true in earlier periods between the Great Depressions. If you take the area yeah. between the Great Depression in the United States of the 1870s and the 1890s, again, you had a period like that. If you take it between the Great Depression of the 1890s and World War I, with, a minor ex with one minor exception, it was similar to that. So that what you have and this is a historical fact, is that except for the Great Depressions, all of which are linked to monetary collapses and to governmental involvement, in the interim period, the society has been reasonably stable. I don't agree with Professor Lukacsman that everything was, I don't want to misparaphrase him, but did pretty well until 1973 and it suddenly all went wrong. It seems to me that the seeds of the subsequent instability, stagflation, were there before, that each time around the economic cycle inflation went a little faster, each time around the economic cycle unemployment tended to be a bit higher. But this brings me to what is my disagreement with Professor Friedman. I agree with him that government has failed to correct and is bound to fail to correct that instability. I do not agree with him that it is the root cause of that instability or that simply removing or containing the government will remove that instability because his constitution, and I agree with all the things he wants to put into it, but I want to put more into it, leaves big capital entirely free to operate. Now, he doesn't mind that. Uh, in response to big capital, you are bound to get, as a simple natural reaction, big labor. He doesn't mind that. He's quite happy with that. But my contention is that once you have big labor, you have a way of setting rewards in society, not only by trade unions, but through all sorts of other processes whereby groups get together in order to exploit the political process and legal rights and to protect themselves from competition, in which inevitably people set rewards above what economists call the market clearing price for labor. I, they set levels of reward which make it impossible that everybody should be employed. You therefore have a built-in tendency to high unemployment. If governments react to that on the Keynesian pattern by trying to inject spending which will enable these people to be employed, then I agree with Professor Friedman that all you get is faster and faster inflation. And, and that, if you like, is caused by the government. But the government is approximate cause of an original instability that is already there. And there's nothing in Professor Friedman's constitution which would correct that inherent, if you like, contradiction or flaw in classical Western political economy. Do you let deny, me, Peter, me, Peter no, I want to ask just one question of Peter. Do you deny that big government plays a large part in the rise of big capital and big labor? I think they're interactive. I once said big, gov big capital causes big labor, causes big government, causes big failure. And that is the tragic story in my and opinion of the 20th century. We have that to that unravel that. If you start that route with big government, will it be wrong? Big government causes big capital, causes big labor, causes I, I don't big failure. I don't think historically that's what's happened. But you and I are agreed we don't want big government. That's right. What we're disagreed about is what else we need. I think something is seriously wrong with a beautiful system which develops this big, clumsy, aggressive government, huge corporations with more influence over their markets than is desirable from the standpoint of free competitive theory. Trade unions, which at least according to some opinions have a similarly malignant influence on their markets. There must be something radically flawed 
with a capitalist system which allows uh, these institutional developments. This doesn't alarm me because I'm a socialist. But uh, I, would, uh, I would readily... There yeah. must be something radically wrong with the socialist philosophy which allows the, the, the extraordinary, the much worse developments that have occurred wherever there has been any real significant attempt to put a thoroughgoing socialism into practice. Socialism is a word of many meanings. No, sure? I think we might easily get into a quite separate debate. <laughs> right. Right. I think it's possible to note in passing that they may both be right, that conventional yeah. capitalism, conventional <laughs> socialism, as conceived in the 20th century, are both wrong, and that the polarization of the debate between those simple two alternatives greatly impoverishes the real range of political economic choices which modern societies have. But what has happened? Over and over again, one claim after another for the kind of socialism, this kind of socialism or that kind of socialism, has turned to ashes. And each time the uh, answer has come, oh well, it was a f wrong brand of socialism that was adopted or the wrong people were running it. But you're saying you're saying not argument yourself, <laughs> No, I'm not. The Federal Reserve in 1929 failed to do the right thing. It was the wrong brand of capitalism. It was a wrong brand, absolutely, but what I'm saying is something different. I can at least point to examples in history of systems, of capitalist systems, in which the government had a fairly limited role, not my ideal government, many things do, doing many things I would not want it to do. But I'm going to point, point to such examples of long stretches of history in which have been relatively successful, where the major achievements of humankind, not merely in economics, but in all other areas, have largely arisen. Yeah, it is very difficult to appoint to any similar you know, examples of where big yeah. government has achieved yeah, such success.